that psalm on my mind. I read it, I thought about it, and he gave me verse 8 to open up to you a little bit. And if you take notes, I've entitled the message, Spiritual Takeout. <laughs> Spiritual Takeout. I think metaphorically speaking, we could say that the Bible is a takeout menu. It's stuff that's in there that we're to take out and we are to apply to our lives or the lives of other people. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And let me just pray again and ask God to open up our hearts and minds. Father, many of us have the mind of Christ. Some of us don't. But we pray that you would open up this text to all of us. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to every heart here and, bring to, and, and meet the needs that we have. Not the wants, but the needs that we have as it pleases you. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Tech, uh, spiritual takeout. You know, that seems, I, I find that titles of sermons sometimes are important because uh, people have told me through the years that they walk away and they say, wow, that was, you know, I can't get that title out of my head. And that title is always connected to a verse, and the verse is always connected to application. I believe with all my heart and with all my soul that the Bible is very clear that it is an application book. It's not something we just read. It's not something we memorize, although we do. The main purpose of God's word is to use it to apply to the situations we face in our life every single day. Period. Now, does it save people? Yes, that's part of the purpose of it. Does it uh, illuminate people? Yes, that does too. Does it get us closer to the, the goal, the, the standard of being conformed to Christ? Oh, yes, it does. But ultimately, it, it helps us to get through this world. What John was talking about was a perfect illustration. The Holy Spirit, had, in my view, has ordained that meeting, that, that barbecue, those people, the conversation. And in doing that, he brought it up, which is a perfect example of what the Bible is for. He is a, is a Christian, a believing Christian, and he understands that everything works by God's sovereign grace. So when he was listening to them talk, he was becoming a little frustrated. And he gets frustrated because he sees things that are obvious to him, but they weren't obvious to the people he was with. And that is the story of the world, period. I always say period because I want you to understand that that's a complete thought. And this is another one. Without the, without the word of God, you're not going to understand what's going on in the world. You're not going to understand the government. You're not going to understand why things happen the way they do. And we all know that because we, before we were saved, we weren't, we didn't, we're always in the process of being conformed. But there was a point in time when we weren't saved and we were just like the rest of the world. I told the, the, the Bible study class this morning, before I was saved, I thought I had a target on my back. Every time I turned around, something bad would happen. I'd say to my friends, is there a target on my back? I think there is. Everybody's picking on me, right? Didn't get it. But once I became a Christian and I, and I knew a little more about the Bible, then everything became crystal clear to me. Our text this morning, in it, there's three things that I want to talk about. There's an invitation, a promise, and a qualification. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. The invitation is to taste God's spiritual takeout menu. That's this. The promise is the soul who tastes and sees that, that the Lord is good. The promise is they will be blessed. And the qualification to eat from God's spiritual menu is very simple. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in him. It's that simple. No deep theology. This is all meat and potatoes simple. With that in mind, I want you to understand that in the spiritual realm, there are only two spiritual menus you can choose from. There's God's spiritual takeout. That's our Bible. Or the devil's spiritual takeout. That's the world. That's it. There's no third choice. It's absolute. There's just two. And important to note... Uh, that I'd have you notice, John pointed out again. John didn't know he was going to be this much a part of a sermon, but he is. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> I wondered how you were going to start this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's important to note that most of the world, most of the world, as John found out in that conversation, will not eat God's spiritual takeout. They won't eat that. They don't want it. Why? Because first of all, they don't qualify. They don't qualify because they don't trust in the sovereign Lord. They don't believe in the sovereign God. And they don't like the taste of God's goodness. Can you believe that? They don't like the taste of it. And you know why? Because to taste it costs them something. They have to give up their sin and they don't want to do it. So they don't want to taste it. They want nothing to do with it. Instead, those who are perishing, those, those poor souls that are perishing right now, they prefer the spiritual takeout that comes from the chain menu, and that's what I like to call it, the, devil's, the devil prepares for them. The spiritual takeout chain me, uh, menu of the devil. And we know that because our proof verse is John 8, 44. It says, you are of your father the devil, speaking to people who didn't believe and trust in Christ. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. And if you break that down, it means anyone who desires, whether you're willing or not, to do the will of the devil is in fact eating from Satan's spiritual takeout. It doesn't matter if you think you're doing it or if you're willing to do it. It doesn't matter. If you're, if you're eating from any menu than this book, you're eating from the devil's spiritual takeout. And some of the items on, that, on his chain menu, if you will, include living and fulfilling the flesh, the desires of the flesh. Now, Galatians 5, 19 and 21 tells us the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And as we know, most of the world is hooked on some of these things, not on all of them. They're hooked on it. And it's also important to note, and, and it is important to note, that the devil's spiritual takeout is highly addictive. These things, the desires of the flesh is highly, is highly addictive. Once you start doing it, it's very difficult to stop it. As a matter of fact, you can't stop it without the blood of Christ. You can't do it. Not only is it highly addictive, it's filled with sinful toxins that are life-threatening. Did you know that? I never understood why I quit smoking back in the 80s. I was smoking three packs a day, and I figured if I don't stop now, I'm never going to see the, 2000, the year 2000, so I quit. But I got to tell you, to this day, I still notice the same thing. It says on a pack of cigarettes, this, this, uh, this product causes cancer. It's very specific now. It used to say may. Now it says it causes cancer. And yet people smoke them. The same thing happens with the devil's uh, spiritual takeout. All the things that people feed on, that people use to, to fill the desires of their flesh, they're addictive, they're sinful toxins in them, and they're life-threatening. And I'll, and I'll show you why in just a moment. But let me give you another favorite spiritual takeout from the Devil's Chain menu. It's deception. If there's one thing the lost love to do is they love to be in the state of denial. You see, if, you're, if you don't know Christ and you don't know that you live in a physical realm, in a spiritual realm, you don't know the difference between the two. You just think you're living, period then you're missing half your life because your life is based both in the temporary world and in the spiritual world. And the only way you can make sense of the temporary world is to be in the state of denial, that things happen by luck, chance, or coincidence. Oh, well, it was just, it was just bad luck. Listen to what Romans 120, uh, 123, uh, 121 and 23 says about being in denial. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. You look around. You can't look around in spring and not see God. You know there's got to be a creator. That stuff just didn't pop up out of, a, out of nothing. You know that. But yet, you, but yet they deny him. 
Because if they don't deny them, they have to accept them and they don't want to accept them. It's that simple. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. And they've done that. And, that does, and when you say, well, how do they do that? Uh, resembling mortal man. There are entire religions that have statues that they worship. They worship pictures. And there's pantheists who worship nature. They think, I spoke to a man not too long ago who said, yeah, I believe in, in the spiritual things. Everything out there has a spirit. A tree has a spirit. The grass has a spirit. All of it has a spirit. And all I asked him was, what's your authority on that? <laughs> Where did you get that from? Where did you think that all those things have a spirit? And if they do, what do they do with that spirit? He didn't know because they don't have a spirit, but he was in denial because there was no other way he could explain it. That's from the devil's takeout menu, denial. They know there's a God, but they don't like what he says, so they're hostile to him. Imagine that. If you don't like what somebody says, you know what, I don't like you because you said that. And you know, that's really in the political scheme today, that's what happens. I asked somebody the other day, as I said, I was in the military during the Vietnam thing, and I went there to fight for this country. I'm an, I'm a, I would call myself an American. And I said to, to this person, what is free speech anymore? I don't understand that. If I say I don't like a lifestyle, you say that I have, you tag me with this thing, which means that I have no right to say it. But if I was willing to sign a paper, take my life and put it on hold for four years, and be willing to die for my country, why shouldn't I be able to come back to my country and say whatever I want till the day I die? Why shouldn't I? And he says, you can, but you're gonna be persecuted. Well, that's good, because that, I'm persecuted now because I'm a Christian. I think that's wonderful. I just needed that answer, but that's really true. I'm not a racist. I'm not a, I'm not a, a homophobic. I'm not under that. I may not, I may not agree with, with somebody's sexual orientation, or I may not agree with their gen, this gender changing thing, but that doesn't mean that I'm anything except I have a right to that opinion, just like they have a right to their opinion, whatever it might be. We live in a world that's filled with denial, and it's very dangerous for Christians because we don't live in denial. We live in reality. The reality is, what this book says. It's not what the world says. It's not what the politicians say. I would remind you that everything in this world, everything in this world that has to do with philosophy or the love of wisdom has, has updates. They're called yearbooks. You go online, I did this once. I Googled truth. And at the time I did it, there were like 3,467,000 truths. I went back two months later, and it was up to almost 400,000 truths. So what's happening is they're developing new truths all the time. They have to update them. This book never had a yearbook. This book has been around for thousands of years. It's never changed, and it's always been effective in lives that, that, that are called to it, period. They live, in, they, they live in denial, and because they don't like what we say, because we don't live in denial, or what God says, I should say, Romans 8, 7 says that they're hostile to God. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. You can't, if you're not born again, if you can call yourself a Christian till the cows come home, but if you can't live your faith and practice a faith that's, that's biblically based, you're not a Christian. You're not. Hard to understand, but it's true. And in addition to denying God, if that wasn't enough, the lost are also in denial about a host of other things. They're in denial about sin. Yeah, I'm a bad boy once in a while, but you know, God understands. He does. He really does. I tell people that he does understand. And one day when you stand in front of him, you'll understand what, what he understands. <laughs> They're in denial about judgment. They don't think God's going to judge them. Oh, God's that old benign old guy up in heaven. He created us, and he says, oh, he winks at sin, and he's, oh, come on. They're nice people. 
They don't believe in judgment. They never heard of Revelation 14.11 that says the smoke of their torment ascended forever and ever and there is no rest day or night. They don't believe in that. They're in denial of that. They're in denial of God's sovereignty. How could God be in charge of everything? I own my house. God doesn't own it. I, my kids are mine. All this, they're in denial. How about his wrath? They don't believe in hell. They don't believe in a lake of fire. They don't believe in it. They believe that God loves everybody. They don't believe the Bible. They're in denial about the Bible. There's actually in a religious, in a religious, it was the congregation, the UCC, I think, somebody went to their office, as I recall, and it said, as you walk in the office, there was a placard that said, we take the Bible seriously, but not literally which simply means I can take this book and I can make it say whatever I want it to say. That's exactly what it means. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe in hell. They don't believe in a lake of fire. They don't believe in the Bible. They're in denial about all of that. I dare say that the perishing, the perishing are living in a continual state of denial every day. They live on luck, good or bad, Chance, coincidence, or even something called Murphy's Law. I never met Murphy, but apparently it's bad things happen to Murphy, and so they, 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 they use that acronym for themselves. Now, the result of being in denial is this. The lost have no real peace. They have no joy. They have no hope. And I say that again because John made the point for me when he said, all they were doing was talking about things they didn't understand. They couldn't understand. They have no peace, no joy, or no hope. Proof for the verse for that is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. God says, or Paul said, inspired by God, speaking to the Ephesians, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise. And here it comes, having no hope and without God in the world. What does that mean? That means you don't understand anything. You don't have any hope. People outside, outside of Christ are in such denial, they have nothing to anchor to. What did, they, what did I anchor to before I was saved? Um, nothing. <laughs> I got up every day and I said, well, I got money in the bank. I can pay my rent. Uh, I'm physically in pretty good shape. Uh, let's see what else. I got a job. Uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. That's what I anchored in. It was all about being anchored in myself. I had a hook in myself. I had nothing to anchor in. So then, when the when the water got high in my life and things started falling away, the bank account started getting a little low. A low. My health started to get a little, a little, uh, little less healthy. I started getting a little less, less healthy. All of a sudden, I'm wondering, uh oh, what's happening now? There's no hope. I never said to myself before I say, well, I guess there's a plan for my life and I'll just have to buckle up and, and expect good things to happen. I never said that. And you never said that. When stuff happened in your life that was less than positive, when you were, when you were under affliction of any kind, you're always trying to figure out how to get out of it. You know what that's called? Surviving. It's not called living. People that are outside of Christ, they don't live. They survive. They get through every day, they eat a meal, they, they, they take vitamins or whatever they do to get through their life, but they're just surviving. There's no purpose to their life. What purpose did I have before I was saved? To get to the next day. To make sure that whatever I could grab for that day, I could grab and fill my pockets or fill my bank account or, or maybe even fill somebody's life. But I had no purpose in life other than to say, what are you, even retirement. People say, well, my purpose is to get old and retire. Then what? What are you going to do then? You're going to take up golf. You're going to take up hobbies. What are you going to do? The world is in a state of continual denial, and they have no hope, and they can anchor themselves in nothing but themselves. Nothing, they can anchor themselves in their family. Family will take care of you for so long. They can anchor themselves in their children. Children will take care of you, maybe. And if they do, for so long. That's it. This is the only hope is in Christ. If you don't have that, you don't have hope at all. And that's where the world is today because the world is in denial 
And the Bible says that they have no hope and they're without God in the world. Also included in the devil's spiritual takeout is loving the world. Why wouldn't a worldling? I loved the world before I was saved. Proof verse is Ephesians 2, 2 and 3. Paul writes, you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that would be Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also, and here comes the word we, he even includes himself, he did it too, before he was saved. We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. He was saying that before Christ came into your life, you had nothing. I had nothing. That's what he's saying. Now the term course of the world means living in conformity with the custom and manners of the world. For example, Judas loved the world because of what money could do in it. The only reason why a thief is a thief is because either they need things. And the only way they can get them because they don't want to work is they steal them. That's what they do. So they're living in the world and they have to have that world because they're stealing so that they can live in that world. Demas. Demas apostatized from his faith because he had a, a closet love affair with it. He did. He was, in, he was with Luke. He was with Mark. He was with Paul. He's mentioned several times in the Bible. Not one of them knew that he was a closet whirling, stuck in a closet. Even uh, Paul didn't know until he, uh, he writes in 2 Timothy 4.10, for Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. That's what Paul knew, that Demas loved the world. And perhaps the best evidence of the lost loving the world is you and me. Think about what, who you were before you became a born again believer. Before we were saved, we loved the world because we could satisfy the desires of our flesh and mind. Before I was a Christian, I was a moral person, but I was a heck of a sinner too. When you look at it from a, from a spiritual perspective. And the thing I did, and the thing that I think all of us did, was we satisfied the desires of our flesh as we could, as best we could, and as often as we could. And sometimes it turned out where nothing bad happened, and sometimes bad things did happen. But we all, all, like Paul said, we all uh, fulfilled the desires of the flesh. Paul told the Ephesians that before Christ you were dead in trespasses and sins, that's what we were, in which you once walked following the course of this world, Ephesians 2.1. We were just going along with the world, and that's what the world does. It's in denial and it wants to fulfill the lust of the flesh and the desires. And while we were living in the world, we were quite comfortable with all the customs of the world. Oh yeah, I thought Christmas was great. Santa Claus, right? Used to put the lights out and, and, uh, and, <laughs> and I used to make fun, really I did, even before I was saved, I used to make fun of those deer because I'm a hunter and when I see deers, I, think, I just think venison stew. Maybe a, a little too much, but I thought about taking those deer out one time. But anyway, <laughs> I thought the Easter Bunny, you know, I thought the Easter Bunny would make a great ragu. I loved ragu, and, and I used to hunt rabbits, and my grandmother used to make a great French dish called, called ragu with rabbits. So I loved those, those things. And there's celebrations, you know, Thanksgiving wasn't about God, it was about turkey. It was about actually hunting. I used to like to hunt on Thanksgiving. Uh, but then it was the, the meal and the friends and the booze and all the other stuff that goes along with the holiday. Sure, I count me in. I was a whirling. I really was. <laughs> and I think most of you were in various degrees the same way before you were saved. And more to the point, we were quite happy, quite happy uh, eating the devil's spiritual takeout. We like feeding the desires of our flesh and our mind. We like the glitter of the world and the things that were in the world. We like the toys of the world, and it was a focus of ours. And we like living especially in the little kingdom of I. And even believers sometime today do that. We spend time in something I call the little kingdom of I. It's all about you. I think of uh, back in the day when doctors uh, were real doctors then. They just weren't people that knew what kind of machines to use. 
uh, they sit down and if they examine you, they had this band around their head with this metal, this metal thing and they used it as a mirror. So what they wanted to see something, they would pull it down like this and they could look in your mouth or whatever and that light would shine in it and they'd see whatever it is they had to see. Well, metaphorically speaking, living in a little kingdom of eye is like that. We all are born with that, that need about being ourselves, be, being in us. So we sometimes will take that little, that little thing and instead of pointing it this way, we turn it this way, and we're always reflecting ourselves. That's living in a little kingdom of I. It's I like, I want, I need. It's not about you, it's about me. And when we do that, it's called living in the little kingdom of I. And as an unsafe person, that was a place I frequented quite often, actually. As a Christian, very rarely, but every so often I have a me day. I cut it out as soon as I realize what I'm doing, but I still do that uh, today. And all of these things, that's addictive and life-threatening, this spiritual takeout food that the devil feeds his children every day, that's what he feeds all the world every single day. In addition to the ungodly, that's people who don't want anything to do with God, there's another group of souls who also feed on Satan's spiritual takeout chain, chain menu. Professing Christians who claim Christ as their savior, but they can't live their life for him to save their life. They can't do it, but they profess him. These are the ones Jesus spoke about in Luke 6, 46. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? It's sad for me to stand up here this morning and tell you that right now, today, this very moment, the modern church, most of the evangelical modern church today is feeding on the devil's spiritual takeout menu right now. For example, a, over a billion souls, a billion professing Christians claim Jesus Christ, but in their practice, they deny him. They pray to the dead for help, but they, uh, they pray to pictures, they pray to statues, they pray rep repetitive prayers on bees. They claim that the leader of their church is the vicar of Christ or the substitute. In other words, when he issues any spiritual called bulls, which a lot of it is, that <laughs> that it is divinely inspired and has the same weight as the Bible. I thought that name was very appropriate when I was in Bible college and they said that. It's called a bull. I said, it really is. <laughs> but there's a billion souls who are doing that and they not only pray to the dead, which is ne necromancy, which is, com which is an abomination in God's eyes. God says, you shall have no other God, about, uh, no other God before you. They also believe, and this is also, they also believe in something called sacraments. And sacraments simply means that they have the ability, and only they, to give absolution for your sins and give you the grace, and give you grace instead of God giving it to you. And that's the truth. That's what they teach, and that's what they eat. Right now, and every single day, they eat those things. And there are countless millions of professing Christians, I would say they're, uh, they're uh, Protestant Christians, who practice worthless worship. Remember that term, worthless worship, because they don't believe God's word. They don't believe it. There's a liberal gospel. Now that li liberal gospel that's going out this morning is telling everybody God loves you, God loves everyone. He loves everyone. And there's no responsibility for sin. It's your body, you do what you want. You marry who you want, you become the sex that you want, you do whatever you want. They don't believe the Bible. Because if they did, they wouldn't teach that or preach that. And then there's a humanistic gospel. <laughs> Man is good in getting better. <laughs> I love that part. How could anybody say that with a straight face in front of people? How could you say that we're getting better? Pick up the internet. Read the newspaper. I don't even know if they have newspapers anymore. But, but, but just look at our world. Man is getting better, really? Oh, my word. Denial. That's really denial. <laughs> uh, 
And then there's the multitude of other Christian cults that claim Christ, but they're eating the devil's spiritual takeout. And there's tons of them. There's the, there's the Mormon church. There's the Seventh-day church. There's Jehovah's, the church of Jehovah. There's all of those cults. There's even Christians who call themselves Christians in Arkansas who believe in drinking strychnine and dancing with rattlesnakes. All right, but I don't believe that's in the book. I don't believe it. And they, and really, and they're doing it to their own, to their own, uh, not just their own safety, but there's no worship in that at all. Bringing any type of animal into a worship service is actually sacrilegious. And perhaps that's why Jesus told those professing disciples in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's not your acts that count. It's not the words that come out of your mouth that count. What counts is what's in your heart. That's all he cares about, what's in your heart. Someone has written, and I quote, there are, there are among those who are called Christians three distinct classes. There are first those who hear without seeing. Then there are those who both hear and see without tasting. And there are those in whom all three combine, to whom faith cometh by hearing, in whom faith grows by seeing, in whom faith is perfected and consummated by tasting. You, and the point is, you cannot understand this book until you taste it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts, who trusts in him. You have to taste this book. And the way you taste this book is you believe it enough in your life to put it in your life every single day. Will you do it perfectly? Absolutely not. But you should do it regularly. You should do it often. And when you put this in your life, what you do is you remove the space in your heart for all the clutter that we like to put in there. I told you before, when you come to Christ, if this is your life, he should be exactly centered in your life and the rest of your life, the things you want to do, the things you can do, your work, everything else should be centered around Christ. It's called the Lordship of Christ. And you can do that only if you're saved. And by that I mean tasting the Lord. Test me. Ta taste him. Test him. Try him out every day. Take something that in your life that you say, I tasted the Lord today. No, don't say that sounds foolish because it isn't. I, I tasted the Lord today. You know how I tasted the Lord? I was on my way somewhere and all of a sudden uh, I, I just knew I had to take a corner and I, had, and I took a different way than usual. I can't tell you why I just did it. That's a door. You went through the door. You tasted the Lord. You got where you were going. You went to your appointment. Everything turned out well. Beautiful. That's tasting the Lord. Conversely, you're going somewhere, and all of a sudden you say, no, nah, I'm going to get over there. I'm going to take the shortcut. You take the shortcut. You get over there. Things don't turn out so well. You get some bad news even. That's tasting the Lord. You're never, you are never to think that you're in charge of the outcome of anything in your life. You're only in charge of accepting that outcome. And that's what faith comes in. That's what faith's for. That's where it comes into tasting the Lord. Whatever he does, you're tasting it, and your faith allows you to accept that no matter what it is. That means if you're not tasting to see the Lord is good, then you're not eating God's spiritual takeout. You're still eating the devil's spiritual takeout. And one last note on the devil's spiritual takeout. If you eat from this menu, if you eat from his menu your entire life, the side effects, there are side effects that you're going to suffer. In this world, you will experience a lack of real hope, joy, peace, love, and comfort. We spoke about that with John. Those people have no clue what peace is. There's no peace in the, oh, they say, oh yeah, I have love, I have peace, I have joy. Yes, you do. I'm not denying that. 
but you don't have this type of love, joy, peace. People say, I have a car, but you don't have my car. That's the difference. You, if you don't have the love, hope, peace, or joy that comes from Jesus Christ, what you have is a semblance of it. It's a shadow of it. It's something that's temporary, and it's conditional, and it has a shelf life. As long as things are going your way, you have all of those things. But the very moment they're not, you don't have it. You're done. Now you're in despair. But for those who know Christ, that peace which passes all understanding, that's what we had our pastoral prayer for. For you to understand that the burdens you carry in your, in your heart for other people, you can take them from yourself, give them to him, come back here refreshed, and forget about it. They're done. And he's in charge. And whatever happens, if, if June's friends get saved, if, if uh, people that were prayed for for healing get healed, great. If they don't, great. Because God isn't moved by us. He's immutable. He's already designed everything. Our plan is to accept what he does. That's what faith does. Faith is things that are hoped for, not things that are seen. I wouldn't have hope if, if Mario... If Mario uh, didn't, uh, didn't get better. I have hope that I prayed for him and no matter what happens to him, I know where he's going. I know he's going to get strong and if he doesn't, then he's going to get weak and if he gets weak and he, God takes him home, good for him. And the reason is because that's what faith does. It, it, that's what being anchored in God is really about. It's not about what you feel, what you, your opinions mean nothing to God. It means less than nothing to God. He doesn't want your opinions. He wants you to have, take the faith that he's given you. Ephesians 2.8 says it was a gift. You are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself that is a gift of God. He wants you to take that faith and taste it every day in your life. In the life of other people. That's what he wants you to do. That's what tasting the Lord and see that he's good. And it doesn't mean that he's good because he does good things all the time. Because sometimes he does things that hurt. My mother did things to me that hurt. Okay? And I'm a better person for it. <laughs> I really am. There was a day when corporal punishment wasn't a sin. It was mandatory. Especially if you had a child like me. <laughs> so they have none. And although you may find substitutes for these blessings and sub substitutes won't satisfy you because every love, joy, and hope that the worldling has is temporary and conditional. But worst of all, worse than even that, if you die on the devil's diet, that's another little catchy phrase, the devil's diet. If you die on the devil's diet, you will spend eternity, infinity. I use that word infinity because I like that. You'll spend infinity in the eternal lake of fire. God himself tells you that truth, gives you that truth. Matthew 13, 41 and 42, talking about the, the judgment. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. And those who practice lawlessness, that's disobedience to God's word, and those who uh, will be cast into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There are many people listening to this who are in denial, who do not believe that day is going to happen. There may be some here, but I know there's some online. They don't believe that day is going to happen. And I can give you a personal testimony of I had the same feeling. Before I was saved, I was a little boy. I was a very bad boy. And my mother said to me, she said, Brian, she said, if you don't cut it out, stop doing what you're doing. I can't tell you what that was, but it was bad if my mother said that. When your father comes home, I'm going to tell him, and you're going to get the what for. And I knew what the what for was. So I didn't care. <laughs> I figured my, it was like... 8 o'clock in the morning, and Dad doesn't get home to fall, she'll forget about it. Well, she didn't. And I know she didn't, because when he came home, the door shut, and I heard her say, Paul, I got to talk to you about Brian. <laughs> and I knew then that I was in very deep sneakers, because, uh, and then I was. That day came, that moment came, but for between 8 o'clock and 4 o'clock, who cared? If you are in denial, that's where you are. This lake of fire that God talks about is as real as the heart beating in your chest right now. And I can think of nothing that's more offensive to God than spending your life eating from the devil's spiritual takeout. Nothing offends him more than that. If that's you, 
You can stop doing that. You have an option this morning. You can stop denying that you're a sinner because we all are. All of us are sinners. Romans uh, 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Before Christ, we are all sinners. Paul even included himself in that. And then you have to understand that the wages of sin is death. You don't get away with, with offending God. It's not like you have this man upstairs that will forgive you for nothing. It takes blood for him to forgive you. And the only blood he'll accept is the blood of Jesus Christ. For the wages of sin is death. And the death he's talking about is not you going, leaving this world and going into oblivion or, or, or purgatory. or anything. Death is hell, is the holding cell till the judgment day, and then you're judged and you're put into the lake of fire. That's how I see it. But it's as real as rain, and that's what you have to understand. You have to understand that hell is as real as rain. And stop denying and, and come out of your denial with that. And, you, and with that understanding, if you understand that, then what you need to do next is you need to repent of your sins. You need to ask God to forgive you. And he will. Repenting of your sins is so sad. How can somebody say, I won't repent of my sins? Oh, because you don't want to. Because God hasn't moved in your heart enough. Maybe that's what it is. But if he has, then you'll feel a conviction of what I'm telling you. This is God's word speaking. This isn't Brian talking. This is God's, God's word. If you feel God convicting you of your sin, that you are a sinner and the penalty of sin is, is uh, eternal death in a very, very bad place, all you have to do is repent of that. All you have to do is turn away from that. Say, you know, I'm done with that life. I don't want it anymore. That's what I did. That's what every believer here did. All of us have to do that. We have to turn away from that sin. And then you ask God to forgive you. And Romans 10, 13 says they will do it. Listen to what uh, God says. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All you got to do is call on Christ. Now people say, well, I did that a long time ago. Maybe you did. Maybe you didn't. If your life hasn't changed one iota since you can remember, then you're probably not saved. There's a distinct life difference in people who are truly born again. The Bible calls them a new creature in Christ. And if you don't feel new, if when you read this book or you're not interested in this book, you're not interested in, in the spiritual things of God, then, then you are in denial of, first of all, that they're there. And second of all, you're in danger of hell. You're in danger of eternal damnation. And I'm going to tell you something. You can't comprehend that. I can't comprehend heaven. I'll, I'll contrast that. People say you're going to heaven at that, uh, Psalm 1611 says, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. I don't get that. I can't possibly understand what God is uh, preparing for me or for you in heaven. I don't, I don't understand the reward system. I just know when I'm going, I'm going to be ready. That's all I care about, being ready. And I can't understand, you can't understand what hell is. You can't understand what the lake of fire is. You can't understand that. And, and in my view, and I'll, if I, I'll stand away from my Bible, in my view, okay, what that means is, if you look it up in the original language, it's, it, it, it's inferring a small enclosed area that's pitch black and filled with the worst pain you can imagine. The fire and the brimstone is a metaphor for the worst thing that you could ever feel. The human flesh feels nothing more uh, worse than, than being burned. And it's a metaphor, and that's real. May not be flames, whatever it is, it's there. And if you want to avoid that, all you have to simply do, he sent him to bleed and die for you. All you have to do is say, you know what, the stuff I'm carrying around in my head that happened 50 years ago is worthless. All the, all the people that I hate, all the people that I do this to, all the bad habits that I have, you know what, they're not worth going to hell. And give them up. And just say, yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm thinking I'm going to do that. And just walk away from it, repent of it, and then call on God. You could do that right there in the pews. You could just bow your head or close your eyes and say, Lord Jesus, come and save me from, my, from myself. Because that's what he's doing. He's saving you from yourself. Come and save me. Make me your kid. Put your arms around me and daddy let me come up on your lap. You're adopted into his family. 
We have not received the spirit of fear, the Bible says, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we call out Abba, Daddy. You know how wonderful that is? I get all goosebumps, and I've, and I've had God in my life for 20 some odd years. I'm still excited by it. Repent of your sins. Turn from them. And ask God to save you. Then pick up your Bible after you do that and start learning and growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Make Christ the centerpiece of your life by living for him. That's how you change your spiritual takeout menu from the devil's menu, chain menu, to God's glorious take out menu. That's how you do it. You know, it's not anything, oh, I got to go through this, or it's not like you got to go through that. Or you got to go through a lesson. No! It's you saying, I've had enough of my life. I want his life. Period. If, you, if any of you, if any, if any of you have a problem with that or would like to talk to me about that, or would like more information on that, you see me or call me and I'll be more than happy to show you in God's world, word how he wants to take the devil's diet from you and infuse in your life a new energy that will change your life in ways you can't even imagine. Now I want to talk, I'm going to close with talking about God's spiritual takeout. For, for, uh, for where am I? Here, here I am. He got a little carried away there. <laughs> okay, the second spiritual takeout comes from God's menu. Now his menu is altogether different. It's packed with energy that will get you through this life and it will carry you right up to the gates of glory. To begin with, God's spiritual takeout is filled, absolutely filled with fruit while you're here. Now I gotta stop there for a second. I gotta tell you something. I love heaven, I'm looking forward to heaven, but I really right now, I lock that out. I really, I lock my salvation away so that the body can't, uh, the flesh can't tempt me anymore. I lock it away, I lock heaven away because I'm more concerned about what I'm doing here. Why? Because I got one shot here to bear fruit for God. When I get to heaven, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about that or not worry about it, but I'll enjoy that, whatever it is. But right now, my focus is in this world helping all of you with your walk with God. And the spirit, his spiritual takeout is filled with fruit. First fruit you receive is unconditional peace with God. Did you know that? When you get saved, you're at war with God right now. The wrath of God is, is still on you. Romans 5.1, therefore, having been, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means now God is for you. Romans 8.31, he says, God is for you. God has adopted you. I told you, Romans 8, 15, you're not, uh, you're not received the spirit of bondage of fear, but the spirit of adoption. And the fruit of peace is not only towards God, we also have the, uh, the fruit of peace in your daily lives. I spoke about that. We have peace knowing that God's providence is working everything out in our life to benefit us. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good to them who love God and to call according to his purpose. I'm not talking fast, I'm excited. Okay? I love it. Everything works out for your good. Where could you get a guarantee like that? Bob's Furniture don't give you a guarantee like that. <laughs> really? And in addition to Romans 8, 28, we have peace in knowing that God has a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans. This is him telling Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for wholeness and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. That's all yours. That's peace. That's real peace. No matter what happens to me, I I'll use this story probably till the day I die, because it only happened once to me. But my car caught on fire, and I'm standing by and saying, huh, God, your car's on fire. There's nothing I'm going to do about it. I was at peace with it. I didn't care if the thing burned. I don't care. That's peace. And it's also uh, uh, not peace towards, um, uh, rather, we have spiritual takeout menu. Another one is forgiveness. I got to tell you something. If people had forget, you know why the world is in this, one of the reasons why it's in the state it's in? Because there's no forgiveness in the world. They don't know how to forget. I didn't know how to forgive when I was in the world. I didn't know how to do that. If, if Linda came up to me and insulted me and then afterwards came up and said, you know something, Brian, I'm really sorry that I did that. I'd say, oh, don't worry about it, Linda. Uh, I forgive you. <laughs> no. I wouldn't forgive her. 
If she did something else, I say, hey, you know, you, I remember when you did that to me before. You did something like that to me before. There's no forgiveness out there. It's all conditional. I'm forgiving you because it's, it's good for me right now. Maybe it's good for you, but if you do it again, I'm going to bring it up. Forgiveness is forgetting. If you say you forgive and you don't forget, then you're really not forgiving. Reason? Christ, uh, God forgave your sins in his son Christ, and they'll never be brought up again. No matter what you do, God will never say to me, Brian, you know, I forgave you for that, but you remember back in the day when you did this? That'll never happen. That's forgiveness. That's true forgiveness, and that is void in the world. It's not there. To know, all that our, uh, to know that all our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven is an incredible blessing. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt, gone, that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside, nailing it to the cross. We're forgiven. Which brings up this point. If you're forgiven by God and you've done some things that were really bad, even if they were in the past, if God has forgiven your past sins, your present sins, and the sins you're going to have in the future, if that blood is efficacious enough to cover you and, for, and, and pay for those sins, then you don't have the right or the responsibility to carry those things from the past with you. As a matter of fact, if you don't let them go, you're committing a sin. The Bible says any man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of, of Christ. And in another section, uh, he talks about, uh, it was, um, I forget where it was. He was talking about how looking back serves no purpose at all. There's nothing back there. Paul said, I look forward. I don't look backward. And pressing toward the mark. You can't carry that cross like this effectively and keep doing this. You can't do that. You have, to, you have to let it go. And I've talked to people before that had great problems because there's been trauma in their life. And um, I've said to them, have you let that go? I'm working on it. Well, you, that means you know, right? Yeah, I have it. I said, I know why. He said, well, I don't know why. Tell me why. I said, because you don't want to. Listen, this is a Brianism. You can do whatever you want. The only thing you can't do is what you don't want to do. And if you don't want to let go of those things, you won't. There's nobody listening to this that had any more things go on in their life, terrible things in their life, than I did, because all things are common to man. And yet, when I got saved, I believed what he said about that blood forgiving me all my sins. They're gone. They're go I can't even tell you what they are now. I really couldn't. That's what you have to do. Guilt, fear, and shame no longer has a claim on you with that blood. None of it. There's no need to hold on to the past because you're forgiven by your Lord and Savior Christ. And the last one is love. His love for us, the spiritual takeout of love, is graphically demonstrated on that cross. There's no greater symbol of love than John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have, everlast, uh, have everlasting life. You will never perish. You'll die. Your body will be sown into the ground. You can look that up in 1 Corinthians 15, starting, I guess, in about, you could start in a whole chapter. It's great. But at the end of it, it talks about planting the perishable and, and getting the imperishable. His uncle, and this unconditional love that we have was gifted to us in Romans 5, 8. God shows his love for us and that while we are still sinners, he died for us. And now I can love you and you can love me unconditionally. We have the ability to even love our enemies, something the lost can't do or won't do. And I'll close by telling you the side effects from God's spiritual takeout. They're breathtakingly unimaginable. In this life... They are healthy, life-supporting, and useful in every situation. Anything you take out of this book and you use in your life will benefit you. There's not one thing you can take out of this book that will hurt you, unless you're, unless you're not saved. But if you're saved, everything in this book is for your benefit. And I would remind you, nothing in this, nothing in this book benefits God. 
There's not one thing in this book that benefits Jesus. Jesus got not one, you know what Jesus got for his suffering? You. That's it. And now you have everything in your life. This, that's a side effect. And, the, and, the, and from eating from his spiritual takeout will bring you comfort, hope, strength, understanding, John, and knowledge to every aspect of your life. And beyond doubt, anything you do in this life will be enhanced dramatically. No matter what you do, it will be enhanced dramatically if you eat from God's spiritual takeout. Jesus put it this way in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Do you feel the love and the certainty in that promise? I give them eternal life and never perish. That's a certainty that made, that's made by God himself. So go home this morning, beloved, and next week, take some of God's spiritual takeout with you everywhere you go. And memorize our text. It's so simple. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 34, 8. That's the spiritual takeout that will energize your life next week if you do it in a big way. Let's pray. Father, you've taken, taken, I can only speak for myself, you've taken me in so many wonderful places and it's almost impossible for me to share them all with your people, but God, thank you for allowing me this morning to share a few of them and I do pray, Lord, that you would burn into the fleshly tablets of those who know you and you know them, our text, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in thee and trusts in him. Lord, let us take that, take that with us this morning and help us next week to taste you in everything we, we do, everything we see, Lord. Help us to see, hear, and taste the goodness of the Lord. We ask it all with faith greater than a mustard seed. In Christ's name, we also ask it. Amen. Our closing hymn, we're going to sing verses uh, one and four, I think, standing on the promises. Blue hymnal 374. Blue hymnal 374.